Hello everyone, and I hope you're having a good day. My name is Paul Bunyan, and today I'm gonna wax on, wax off my class guide videos, cause it's time to talk about the monk. Monks are unique in the world of the martial classes, as they choose to meet the evil dragons and demons of D&D with not a bunch of swords, not with rage so strong it can make the Hulk blush, but by kung fuing the hell out of some bad guys, letting you live out everyone's favorite martial arts movie, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragonborn. By mastering their bodies, minds, and spirits, monks can do all kinds of crazy shit. Dodging, running on water, shooting lightning out of their hands, to punching someone with so much wisdom that you make their heart explode. Their extreme kung fu senses have awakened, and they tuck and roll through danger, adding their wisdom bonuses to their unarmored AC, making them dodge tanks. But bear in mind, you are not an HP tank, so do not go thinking you can stay on the front lines like a barbarian. I personally feel that the monks' abilities shine brightest when they're used for hit-and-run tactics, using their high close-range damage and mobility to get in and out quickly. In addition to your unarmored defense, you get some neat martial arts. Your unarmed strikes deal d4 damage, that damage increases as you level up, and you can use your dexterity modifier instead of strength for your attack and damage rolls. You also get one additional attack at the start of every turn as a bonus action. But at second level, you get the key ability of the monk. <laughs> yes, because, because you see, you see, it's called key. That's their ability. It's called key. You know, you know, key. The, the, you know, the. Key is the life energy that flows through all things, and it lets your monks do magic. You can get a new resource called Key Points, telling you how much key you have. This number starts at 2 and increases as you level up, with each subclass getting unique abilities that require you spend key points to use them. Not all key abilities have the same cost to them, so make sure you check the price tag on each ability before buying it. Now, as for what key lets you do, it again reinforces the idea of a monk being a mobile glass cannon. You can disengage, dodge, or dash as a bonus action, you can attack two additional times with the ever-famous flurry of blows, and on top of this, your movement speed increases by 10 feet as long as you aren't wearing armor, and eventually, you can run along walls and water if you aren't wearing armor. As you level up, you slowly but surely gain more and more anime bullshit powers. You can catch missiles and throw them back, you can reduce falling damage, you get a free extra attack, your punches can stun your opponents, your unarmed strikes count as magical, you can straight up dodge fireballs and take zero damage from them, you can't be charmed or frightened, you become immune to poison and disease, you can communicate with any other creature using your key, you can reroll saving throws, you can stop aging, you straight up turn invisible for a minute, and at level 20, you'll always regain 4 key points at the start of every combat if you're tapped out. Point is, Key lets you do all kinds of crazy thing, and the monk itself is great for anyone who wants to go kung fu fighting. Now, let us meditate on the monk subclasses, called monastic traditions. Just like any other subclass, you pick it at level 3, and each one will alter the monk in some way, to persuade you into more specialized playstyles. Starting with the way of the open hand. You ever see that anime or the memes of that one guy hitting the other guy a bunch and then goes, Yeah, that's basically this subclass. The Way of the Open Hand is the monk's melee-focused upgrade class. You are a martial arts master. You can heal yourself as an action, your flurry of blows can now knock people prone, push them away, or rob them of their reactions. You can cast the Sanctuary spell during a long rest, and at level 17, you can punch someone so hard they explode. If you want to tell Strahd he can go wax off, the way of the open hand is for you. Now moving on to the way of shadow. Congrats, you are now a ninja. Your key lets you cast darkness, dark vision, and pass without trace, and minor illusion to mess with the perception of your enemies. You can straight up teleport between shadows, and you can become invisible when you hide in shadowy or dimly lit areas. And finally, you can use your reaction to attack a creature that has already been attacked by someone other than you. I can't lie. It's cool to picture a shadow monk striking someone from out of nowhere, casting darkness, and then vanishing like, well, a ninja. Pick the Way of the Shadow if you want to feel like you are the knight. Way of the Four Elements Moving from Naruto to Avatar, the Way of the Four Elements turns your monk into more of a half-caster. Your key lets you cast offensive elemental spells with the main ability of the subclass, Elemental Disciplines. 
You get more of these elemental disciplines as you level up, you can swap them out whenever you choose a new one, and some of them work in concert with your basic monk abilities. My personal favorite is the Fist of Unbroken Air, where you punch the air so hard it sends bullets of compressed air to obliterate some orcs, dealing damage and knocking them prone. By level 5, you can spend additional key points to cast these key spells at higher levels. And as cool as this sounds, I find this subclass has one major flaw. You have a limited amount of key points, and eventually you'll need to take a long rest to get them back. Once you're out, you're basically crippled. I would suggest talking to your DM about changing the key point cost of certain abilities, or working out a system that has you gain key points at the cost of hit points. I don't know, just an idea. That said, if you want to keep the Fire Nation from attacking, pick the Way of the Four Elements. Now, if you're the player that brings booze to every session, then you are already proficient in the Way of the Drunken Master. These intoxicated disciples use unpredictable movements that turn them into more brawlers than straight DPS. You get skill proficiency in performance and proficiency with Brewer's Supplies, you can disengage when you use the Flurry of Blows, your walking speed increases by an additional 10 feet for your turn, and you can get up from prone at the cost of 5 feet instead of half your movement speed. You can cause a creature's attack to hit someone else if it misses you, you can spend your key to remove disadvantage on attack rolls, and finally, you can make up to 5 attacks with your Flurry of Blows instead of the usual 3, but only if each target is different. The Drunken Master is great at fighting multiple enemies at once, and is also good for aggro control. Not to mention all the free booze. Just be careful with this. The Drunken Master might be a touch more survivable, but you're still a monk, and if you start taking damage, you're gonna feel it, no matter how much beer you've had. Moving on from liquor to pointy things, the way of the Kensei is a monk that decided to do away with the fists in favor of stabbing things. At level 3, you get proficiency in additional weapons called Kensei weapons, dramatically increasing your weapon choice. You get a plus 2 to your AC if you make an unarmed strike while holding your Kensei weapon, your ranged attack gets an extra 1 die 4 damage, and you get painters or calligraphy supplies. At higher levels, your Kensei weapons become magical and you can spend your key points to have them deal extra damage. Eventually, you can spend even more key points to give your weapons a bonus attack and bonus damage, and you can reroll missed attacks with that weapon once per turn. There's not much to say about this one. It is pretty neat, but it lacks some of the flavor of the other subclasses. Now, if your DM doesn't let you make an unarmed attack while holding a Kensei weapon, especially if you picked a two-handed weapon like a great sword or a glaive, kindly remind him that you have feet and you are not above kicking goblins. That's how I do it, at least. And you should always listen to people on the internet, because of course, I would never lie to you. Moving on, we got the subclass that always turns into a Goku or Vegeta clone, the Way of the Sun Soul. Arguably my favorite monk subclass, Sun Soul monks learn how to project their key into magical bolts of energy. At level 3, you can make ranged spell attacks up to 30 feet away when making your unarmed strike. This bolt of radiant damage scales with your unarmed strike damage, and at higher levels, you can cast Burning Hands by spending your key. You can create a spirit bomb that deals 2 die 6 radiant damage to anything in a 20 foot radius, and finally, you shed a golden light around you at all times, and you can use this gold light as a reaction to deal radiant damage equal to 5 plus your wisdom modifier whenever a creature hits you with a melee attack. Despite the untold hundreds of Dragon Ball jokes that have already been made by every other D&D YouTuber and player in the known universe, there is no denying that the ability to shoot lasers out of your hands is super cool. But I swear to god, if you call your character Sun Wukong like I don't know what you're talking about, I will kick you from the chat. Moving on to the subclasses found in Tasha's, we've got the Way of Mercy. These monks learn to manipulate life force, becoming the healer subclass of the monks. Ironically enough, this manipulation of life force also makes them really, really good at killing shit. To start with, you get proficiency in insight and medicine and the herbalism kit. You get a spooky scary mask that lets people know you totally want to help them. Hold still to me, I will cure you. And you can spend your key as an action to touch a creature and restore HP equal to your martial arts die roll plus a wisdom modifier. And if you use your flurry of blows, you can replace one attack with this healing touch, effectively punching the life back into your allies. Or you can use your key points to deal necrotic damage instead, using that same formula. 
At higher levels, you can use your healing touch to cure diseases, poisons, blindness, deafness, and paralysis. You can now replace every strike in your flurry of blows with either the hand of healing or the hand of damage. And at level 17, you can bring a creature back from the dead, as long as they haven't been dead for more than 24 hours and you have 5 key points to spend. Monks of the Way of Mercy are masters of both martial and medicinal arts, and you become COVID's worst nightmare. But on the more spiritual side of things, we've got the Way of the Astral Self. The Way of the Astral Self is for monks who want to punch people with their soul, or who watch JoJo on the regular. You become so in tune with your spiritual self that you can summon deadly ghost arms to beat people up with. These astral self arms used wisdom instead of strength when making strength saving throws and unarmed strikes, and you get 5 feet of additional reach with them. And it only costs one key to summon them for 10 minutes. Also, these arms deal force damage instead of bludgeoning damage. At level 6, you can use your key to summon the entire astral self, granting you the ability to see in magical and non-magical darkness, giving you advantage on insight and intimidation checks, and you get a limited telepathy up to 60 feet. At higher levels, your astral self becomes stronger, letting you deflect elemental damage like fire and ice, and your astral arms deal extra damage equal to one additional martial arts dice. Finally, the power of your stand becomes so great that you can spend 5 key points to awaken your astral self. For 10 minutes, it can move around the battlefield and take actions as any other character. And it gives you a plus 2 bonus to your AC and 1 additional attack each turn. Now, as cool as this sounds, you still run into a problem of allocating your stat points. Your offensive abilities are all based on wisdom, but you still need dex or you're asking for death. Also, your astral self doesn't have to be a ghostly form of you. It is a representation of your spirit and personality, so it can take on the form of a big muscly dude, or a dancing frog that punches people, or literally just a talking meatball. I don't know, you pick. Still, the way of the astral self is very interesting, and it's sure to get you into the spirit of D&D. And now we come to the final monk, the way of long death. With a name fitting for the subclass, as these monks take forever to die. Right off the bat, you get Life Steal, as killing an enemy gives you temporary HP. Your actions can be used to frighten others, and you can spam it because they ain't got a cooldown. You receive a Get Out of Death Free card for the cost of one measly key point once per turn, and you can spend even more key points to pump someone full of necrotic damage. This subclass is wonderful for the more reckless player. It doesn't do too much to change the monk, but it does make you a heck of a lot more survivable. The way of the long death is for anyone who wants their monk to have that sweet, sweet edge. But also to not die, please. I haven't written the second character sheet yet. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a like if you did, comment down below about your favorite way to play a monk, and subscribe for future videos. Check out my socials in the description below, and maybe support me on Patreon. Thank you very much, and don't forget to have fun on your next adventure.